So, good evening. Thank you for braving the elements and uh, showing up this evening. I'm Stephen Yenser, uh, from the, representing the English department at UCLA. Uh, and uh, this, this event is sponsored by the English department and by, uh, well, I guess we can still say by the Friends of English which is an organization that uh, for many years has supported these programs. You can hear me all right, can't you? Yeah. Good. Uh, and, of course, the hammer, and uh, which is really, for, for our purposes, Claudia Bester, who does such a great job of keeping everything in order around here. So a few days ago, um, I was thinking about this evening, and, of course, about Susan Wheeler, uh, when I got an email from a friend in Arizona who has a, a knack for uncanny connection and who had just seen, she reported, uh, up in a sycamore, an elegant trogon. And, you know, well, of course, I was very excited. Uh, I mean, I'd never heard of an elegant trogon. Uh, so I did what my mother always told me to do and looked it up and I discovered that a Trogon elegans is of course a bird uh, native to Brazil, rare in the United States but glimpsed occasionally in uh, Arizona's canyons and I found the Audubon Guides picture of it too. Um, it's a stunning bird. Uh, it's outrageously variegated with metallic greens and uh, black and yellow touches here and there, but velvety reds and blues, you would think it would be very dangerous uh, to be so outrageously beautiful and uh, vivid out in the wild. And there I was with Susan's books on my desk, and suddenly, uh, I was seeing anew uh, how vividly assorted, uh, how diverse her verse is. Um, diverse not only in genre with lyrics haunted by Renaissance songs and uh, nonce forms based on Provençal schemes uh, and ingenious, complex, ekphrastic meditations with their lines cast across the, uh, the pages like Mallarmé's dice uh, and uh, soulful American blues, all of this in, in, in one volume, sometimes a single poet, because their poem, they're, they're diverse not only in genre but also individually, so that a, a given poem might quote Chaucer's complaint to his purse, uh, or a, a, a treatise, which I didn't know, probably some of you do, by one John Wheeler, uh, who is perhaps not a relative. Uh, and anyway, it begins uh, with a, a, a list of birds uh, to be trafficked. There's going to be a bird motif, as you can see. Um, and uh, this, this along uh, will show up in a Susan Palm along with uh, an allusion to Seinfeld or uh, Hollywood Squares. Uh, maybe some, some quoting of some salty uh, New York slang uh, and something from uh, what's now antique, I guess, Valley Girl speech. Uh, all of this is, is part of the, of the language, some phrasing from Ezra Pound and uh, John Berriman, too. So she is, uh, to change birds in the, in the middle of this flight, a magpie. Uh, or because her, her verse really sings, uh, she's uh, more perhaps of a northern, uh, northern mockingbird, which is a mimus polyglottus for, for the bird watchers out there. In the, in the opening poem uh, in Meme, which is her most recent volume, she asks with uncharacteristic plainness, where is there room for all I have to say? in the deepening dark of a fall's afternoon. Toward the end of the book, we come on this passage. Such is the state of poetry, 
caught in my throat on its way to my mouth, why not do everything? Uh, the reasons for not are self-evident. Um, anything, at least, uh, if not everything. Uh, and she does it so, so quickly and so wittily, uh, cutting the mellifluous with the edgy, uh, that it sometimes seems a kind of nouveau bebop medley. Uh, this wheeler, uh, as they say of a risky batter at roulette and cards in Vegas, wheels and deals. Uh, but that's a generalization, and to, to generalize is, is to be an idiot, as Blake said. Uh, of course, he was generalizing. Uh, but then he was Blake, it's, it's, it's okay. Anyway, you, you need particulars, uh, which you are about to get. Um, ah, and I, I forgot to, you don't have assorted poems with you, do you? Get a couple of books. Get books. There are a couple on sale uh, at uh, at the table, uh, and Susan will even even sign them for you. Um, but I wanted to show you the cover of this one. Uh, do you see? Can you see it well enough? It's the, the beautiful colors and the kind of Brazilian colors, and there are feathers here um, in this hybrid, beautiful hybrid creature, and so. Uh, this is my illustration for the evening of the elegant Trogon. Um, and you see what the, the title is, is Assorted Poems. So, uh, Susan Wheeler. Thank you so much, Stephen. It's really, um, I've come out a couple of times to read and it's, it's always a privilege, a joy, um, even though I'm an Easterner at heart, so I'm very comfortable in this, this weather tonight. Um, and I'd like to do something, try, try an experiment tonight, which I, since I had an unexpected layover in Cleveland last night and was, um, and without a lot of sleep. Um, so the first thing I'll forget is facts, names, and that sort of thing. Um, um, I almost thought about again, but I think I'd like to try talking a little bit more than I usually do in between the poems and inviting anything, um, any question, any comment um, in between the poems that you feel called to make. Um, and you've got handouts, which I thought might help precipitate this a little bit. Um, and these are of a few of the poems that I'll read, um, I tried to pick ones in which it, it might be helpful to see what the words actually are on the page. Um, the poems go by pretty quickly. Um, a few are conventionally narrative, but a lot of them aren't. Um, and so I also hope that you'll use the blank page at the back of the handout um, to write anything. If you're daydreaming, if you know things, if you remember something for the shopping list, what have you. And um, you're welcome to share those as well. Um, I've been told that there are mics in the back. Um, yeah, people who are equipped. So um, if you, if you, if this doesn't uh, inhibit you further, um, you can wait for a mic as well. I'm tempted to start with a bird poem, but um, I'll save that for a little later. And um, 
I wanted to read the first three poems on this sheet. I haven't been back since the last presidential election, and um, I think I think a lot of people have been unusually circumspect um, following it. I certainly have been, and um, and so this was this was my first response, and then there are poems that all come out of that. Upside down ballot election night. The Times Square ticker leads us on its service leash before clonazepam in bed. I, among the 30 that we are beside the grifters idling uptown bus, feel our cracker hearts freeze, expand, and fissure us. Crackers, crackers, what have we done? What have we bred? The ticker yanks, breaks our latch, and we howl home to bed. And so I started writing a number of cracker poems, um, since that's very much what I feel like. Um, a, a, a warning, this is not gonna be a, a, an uplifting reading, um, <laughs> but I wish these were uplifting times. So this is Cracker 2, it starts out with a quote from Jose Angel Argus and every other man I am. The cracker is always late to the scene. When the doctor speaks, the cracker takes her hand from her ear while the other massages her arches. The cracker fills his plate with heaps of potatoes. The cracker is careful to smell his best. Charity, always charity. If you say this is an I do this, I do that, well, I'll swing at you. The cracker defends her ground. The cracker may have a helium voice, but when we last heard us, we were growling. Underneath the trees, we stopped for a light refreshment. A heron like a hand trailing its fingers in the water dangled its legs as it surveyed the river. The cracker missed it like we missed most things. The boy in the small bark, for instance, shivering or the woman scarfless, sunk to the floor in the fray and covering her hair with her hands, while Jorge, or is it Juan, or is it Javier, looks on. I'm sort of, I've always been fascinated, and maybe some of you have had this experience, although I hope not to the extreme that I have, of looking back and, and recognizing one's own cluelessness as time goes on. Um, and so, sort of during this whole period of, of circumspection and looking at that, um, I realize that I've been thinking about it in similar ways for a long time. Um, some of you in this audience, some of you won't, but some of you will remember the television show Quincy. Um, The bog man stippled in celluloid grist for the mill. The Mohican is Irish now on screen, his father a shill. I've gone to the meadow, I've come back and lost the wails of the widow, the brass of the boss. Quincy's props man packs the sham socks, he whistles this song. The airport in Lagos teams over, the reception's all wrong. We sing what we know of, we singe when we try the poster head glowing against a dumb sky. How did we know what we see when we saw through the mind? What citizen without cummerbund could Columbo yet find? What morning is meek grief? What picture is true? The raveling of relief, the singing as Jude. Um, and that was occasioned by back 20 years ago. Um, the assassination of 
the opposition leader in Lagos um, occasioned the U.S. to send autopsy investigators to oversee the autopsy um, in a sense that they would be fair. So I'll read the next one, Misophonia, in the handout, um, which starts with a quote from M. Norbezi Philip, forgive me this dumbness, continuing the theme. And I guess I'll, what you hear in a lot of these are various vernaculars. Um, and I used to think that you could do everything. And it's helpful, of course, in a writing practice to pretend that you can, but it's a trick of the mind. And, um, and regret comes heavy after um, and quickly. Misophonia which of course is the sort of phobia about hearing people chew and stuff, um, particularly parents, as I recall. <laughs> you open the door on the corner, spread your change on the counter, uncrumple the bills, I wary on you. You hear in the back lot, Princess Bay like a baby and she doesn't stop. At school, you were the one to get clowned on. Your uncle lay a blade on the table before you. Nah, but you came around. The intakes like reefer, like laughing gas, like coke. She wanted you, then she didn't. You wanted her, then you didn't, but you thought you did. Like the rev of a thumper, like morphine. Won't princess stop? Anything? Anybody want to? say, ask so far. I don't want you to feel on the spot. Um, but. So this also, uh, uh, during this period of working on these, um, it, one of my colleagues died, the poet C.K. Williams, and um, he was very beloved of all of us. and. And something that I'd always admired about his poems was the kind of vulnerability that came out just directly through them um, and how quick they were to take himself to task, even though he claimed, uh, in fact, once when he'd written a poem about being in the hospital and being very sick, I came up to him in alarm after seeing it in the New Yorker, and he said, Susan, it's a poem. <laughs> so, but nonetheless, they come across as very vulnerable. And I was, um, I was, I wanted it sort of to honor him rather than write a traditional elegy. I wanted to somehow um, do something like in response, and um, which for me is uncharacteristic, um, since I like to keep my foibles, uh, except for tonight, of course, um, sort of closed and to myself. Um, so this is a, a, a poem called The Lie after the poem by C.K. Williams from which it takes its last two lines for Charlie. You were in the field, your socks slipping into your shoes under the heat lamp of the sun, the woods winking, the cool of the trees stuck to your destination as you tick off transgressions. The man behind you says, a melange of mirages, and again, a melange of mirages, liking the sound. A turkey buzzard surveys the tree line, Nettles and stingweed, scraping seeds. You once plied a boyfriend with drink, like a pirate extolling the gangplank. You used Mexican as a noun. Shame even now ignites the chickweed at your knee. It must be one o'clock. Heat flares from the heat lamp. 
Are there field mice, he says, under our feet? And multiple gyres, the banging black flies. Hoppers, trapeze from the grass, speech that is white ashen speech. Like that afternoon, cameo summer in October. I must have been a senior in high school soon, looking to leave a heel over heels for Tom, who worked in a quarry. Now I remember arms, beard, kindness, and econoline. But that afternoon, knowing soon Mom would be home from picking up Dan, Tom and I swung out the screen door and struck into swamp woods at the end of the street. When you think of white, do you think of Rembrandt in darkness, pockmarked, a sieve, or a monkfish? A head now, a head then, ash, scrub pine, shade, and penny, then twelve then my brother's soul friend, then the body I knew best outside of my own, whose fur was still full with her striated mane, her funnel nose, whose name I bestowed when she was a pup, Penny came to. Obliviousness from Oblivisi to forget. One thing led to the next. On a dry knoll, Tom took off his shirt and I unzipped. Less, a lamp. The hazed beam slipped horizontal. You ticking away, your hand in a tassel. Other batting the hoppers in full sun won't imagine. I understand. Dusk in October, even in heat, has denouement at its, at its center. You're hearing the man who is singing behind you. Before we headed back, we called and called. She must have gone home and turned without yarn, without clue. Retraced our steps at the driveway Tom left. I went in. Now at the wood's edge, the cool cools you, dark switches the lamp. The man takes your hand, folds you to him. Your damps a solder yet, untested. Adults, you hear the turkey hawk stoop and land on the branch nearby of a birch. Carry on. Horse with its blinders, cell self-selected. Fist the clasp straw, a miser refuting the bounty without it. That night for hours up the street, I heard voices call Penny saw flashlights like cleaks in the trees. Oblivion that made you, hopper from the hand you swing, the cool curiosity of sight, the sound of a man's laughter, scatter as one would with a self which savagely resists, this amputating, this assailing, this self-slashing. I worked on that um, poem over a long period. I couldn't figure out how to conflate the two time sequences in it. Um, and uh, just coincidentally, the two days after, um, after finishing it, my dog of 14 years died. So it was particularly, um, yeah, I haven't read it since aloud for others. Um, so this is, I don't think this is in your handout. This is um, a bird poem. And relatively recently, this is now where I'm turning my scourge on others. So this is more fun. Um, <laughs> the bird denizens of Scarlet Town. What a disappointment that bird was. King Hawk on his perch is plucking the fuzz. The crows and the finches duck down because a hawk's measure is all a hawk knows. Vireo's a triller, its cry doesn't screech. A sparrow in fury sounds just like E.T. A jay only mimics a red shoulder spree once you thought my talons would grow. Chickadees and warblers flock where they go, a heron stalks, a pheasant crows. Flycatchers dive on cicadas, not moles. 
a hawk's measure is all a hawk knows. And this, um, this I think is in your packet. It's a poem with lines from John Wieners, and um, this is a little loopy in terms of what it brings in. So I hope this, I hope the, yeah, Brian. Well, I hope the packets, I was just going to say, I hope the packets are, are helpful. I thought about doing super titles, and, but then I thought, no, that's too much production, even for LA. Um, so. Oh, I, I, oh, I'm just taking advantage of your invitation early in the reading yeah. and being a little mischievous. Um, so you used the word cracker early in, in your poems, right? And I. You know, I've, worked, I've used the word chink in one of my poems, and uh, you know, I was taken to, to task for it, you know, in a kind of situation like this, where people were just like dumbfounded. So my question is like, and I didn't even know what the term cracker meant until probably I saw like a Chris Rock uh, comedy uh, stand-up thing. It's not something I grew up with, but how do you feel using a term like that, or what does that mean, and why is it of, of uh, especially importance after the Trump election? Well, I think, um, I think the, it's sort of obvious now, well, it's not, I don't mean to sort of generalize, <laughs> but it, I, the election was all about race, I think, and, um, and as a white person, I think a lot about being a white person. Um, and have for a long time, but I didn't, you know, it's, it's by degrees and you look, you know, 10 years ago and you think, oh God, I was so stupid. Um, and I think that'll happen through the rest of, and I feel like cracker is a pejorative term, but um, I think it's, you know, white people are, do a pejorative term. <laughs> In a way, it's kind of our turn. And, um, and I very much include myself. So um, I guess that's, yeah. And I'm not sure when, I know I've had it in the back of my head for a long time, that word. Um, I didn't necessarily grow up with it, and I don't even remember, I was probably in my 20s when I first heard and said, what, cracker? Um, but that's the fortune of being a cracker, I guess. Thanks. Anybody else want to add to the cracker discussion? Yeah. Hi. Um, so do you think it's a good thing that he got elected if it, like, woke you up in that way? No. <laughs> <laughs> if no. it required that? Yeah, no, uh-uh. <laughs> I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think so, no. Um, it, it, who knows, who knows what it would take for, you know, individuals on a wide scale to get the kick in the butt that, we clearly needed, but um, I think that the disastrous consequences out are are not worth it, or not. You know, I think something else might have precipitated. At least I hope. Yeah. So this is um, a poem with lines from John Wieners. And from his nerves, oh, poetry visit this house often, which is also the first line. Oh, poetry visit this house often. Out of your graves, tell us what poetry feels, if not respect for the suffering. You've taken the teaspoon from the glass you stirred hurt in and dropped it bowl first in the sink. Now, two o'clock rolls round again. Tell us how the cisgender man invented vajazzle in its drugstore display. 
Make your most forsaken memento the body you dove from at ten in the lake at the lake. The old gods are gone. Your lookout for them, scratched as it was on the crumb of a muffin, kept you up days in the office in Leeds. Is he here? You can still hear the whistling teeth of the secretary there. Again, under young middle-aged bellies in the summer, the furious men on your block pounded with balls the vast strip of tar until the net flapped in the wind. You drove back by this house parking, lot talking, talk of a poem. And even in the rose bush, bush breeze, his shaven cheek did not come close to yours. Tell us what poetry did to proffer a Kleenex from air. Um, yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, so what, uh, what poets are you reading now? Now? Um, recently I've gone back to Heine, um, who has been sort of a, an evergreen for me. Um, and Uh, I've just hit sabbatical, so um, I'm just starting to dig in again. And um, and he was the one that I started with, and then I went off on a on a friends bender, which happens as a writer, um, and read two terrific Yi Yun Lee um, new novel. Um, which is just extraordinary. And Darcy Steinke's um, treatise called Flash Count Diary, um, which will be due out in June about menopause. Uh, it's called Menopause and the, uh, oh, this is what I forget when I'm tired. Um, it's a wonderful Latinate. It's maybe regulation in uh, of natural life, um, and that's a barnstormer. Um, but I'm looking forward to reading a lot of recent, recent publications that, in the thick of things, I haven't yet. Um, and with this John Wiener's poem, I had never really read him and started on a Wiener's Bender last summer, um, just kind of nuts for what he wrote. Um, and that last line, tell us what poetry did to proffer a Kleenex from air, came out of something further, or not as far back as Wiener's, but um, I was in New York and 9-11, and um, a friend of mine knew one of the widows who was organizing the memorial services um, that happen every year on site in New York. And she wanted to know the first year uh, some poems. She wanted some recommendations of poems that could be read at this memorial. And so I had a sort of handful in my head, but I asked a number of other poets. And um, one poet, who was a poet laureate, um, Robert Pinsky, came back and said that he didn't believe that poems could be cons should be consolation. And so he would, he recommended some really sort of bleak, <laughs> scary, scary poems, which are extraordinary poems, but um, that made me think a lot about whether poetry could console, and of course it does, um, and even good poems console. Um, one of the worst moments after my dog died was they, they 
put her ashes in a box that had a brass key. It was just overdone, the whole thing. And then this card with these insipid, insipid dead dog lyrics in them. <laughs> and it was just, um, so not necessarily all poems console, but poems, I think, yeah, anyway. Um, this is a poem for my stepson, Jonathan, clever by half. It's not about him, so it's kind of snide poem, so it's just turn he wanted a sonnet, it turned out this way, and anyway. Um, clever by half. Deutschland wasn't a bad place to begin with Werther mooning through the Strassenfest. Knucklehead, Uncle Meldrum would have called him from up on the ladder, tacking tie back in place. Idiot is the term preferred these days. Though both monikers work for Leslie Nielsen, whose myopia is felled only aliens or planes. Equal they don't our top tricks namesake. I tell you, I used to listen to Fitty Fitty, now I'm down with Mississippi, or not. What this talk meets is just our bets. We will come down on Meldrum's side of things. He ran Topeka's Diffenderfer funeral home, so knew what if he spoke, I guess. So I think that's all that you have copies of. So now you're just at sea. So anything really is fair game to say or what have you. Um, then came the latest uh, Supreme Court hearing. Um, this was an this is an older poem, "Loy for Girls," um, where I I I love. I've, lo I've loved literature that's really sort of bodily gross um, and realized at a certain point that it was all written by men. So this is, um, this is Malloy for girls. To him who has nothing, it is forbidden not to relish filth, Samuel Beckett Malloy. In the tall grass lot we sniffed the gas. We puked jujubes, the multi-pack. I don't know why he gave me rocks. I found them in my pockets after the act. After the act, he ran across the tall grass lot into what could have been a reservoir. I wanted to see what jujube colors stuck as I rolled around in the tall grass lot. He'd have never said the words like this. The red chunks stuck on me the best. I didn't know anything about Bohemian Grove, which probably is Californians you all know about, but I just found out a few months ago. Bohemian Grove. Put your pecker away, please. <laughs> um. Then with the hearing, I, I wanted to find, I, I, I guess, I, I wondered where grace could be in that. Um, so that occasion, this next poem, which repeats a lot, but um, I think it's, it's pretty clear. It's called The Meeting. Most of us were there for sex. One's mom chained her to the radiator. One's raised a chair and tried to break her. But most of us were there for sex. Most of us were there for sex. A man or two, too. The literature stated there were holes in us all for a violator. The men were there for sex. Most of us there for sex on those metal chairs had to feel safe or we'd leave. 
<laughs> that, for me, came later. I thought I was there for sex. Most of us were there for sex, usually the dad with the mom's imprimatur, sometimes a cousin, a classmate, a neighbor. Most of us were there for sex. Sometimes one man there for sex shuffled to his seat like a slow freighter through us and drew close his layers. Most of us were there for sex. This man who was there for sex one evening described the subway car, the sudden overcoming, like the snake where Adam knew he was there for sex. He hadn't known he was there for sex until a woman in the car started to rake her hair with her fingers down the side of her sweater. Then he knew he had come for sex. Though we were all in the room for sex, one of us bailed. Her heels on the slate were a pause in his speaking. He couldn't hate her for walking out on his story of his coming for sex. Then the man who was there for sex said he unwrapped the coat hanging over his gaiters to the nothing underneath for the eyes of his neighbors. Most were not in the subway for sex. The man who was there for sex said he could not not do this. Even shame elevates or enhances the urge. Even here, it's an agitator. All of us there for sex looked away. Most of us were there for sex but he kept his coat wrapped. Was he brave or cruel to unburden this weight on us the, who were there for sex? One of us who was there for sex said, touched on the street, on the job, to violate her here in this place was enough to break her and most of us who were there for sex. Most of us were there for sex, while outside in the night the city cradled her waitresses, dancers, her homeless, her skaters, most of them were there for sex. I thought I had come for sex. Did my he or not? Once savior, once satyr, he lurked in unsterile incubators. Most of us were there for sex. hard to say, I guess, whether he should have or not. Nickled and dimed. <clears throat> this is how to sustain it. Lose some money, the house. Lose, say it, the art. Lose an ocean of time. Lose the faith of a friend, of a foe of yourself. Lose your voice for a few torpid months. Lose your shit on the phone with Verizon. Lose your patience, your daddy, the baby, your mom. Break your fall with your finger. Break your finger, a foot, your unremarkable heart. Break your back to be on time, then break out of jail. Go when you shouldn't, break when you should. The sickle you'll break at the start of the harvest. Break the chain letter that broke the sad news. Leave the land of your peoples time and again you'll be stopped at the airport attempting return. Leave your senses, leave your love and their lover. Leave the parent you were for the mute you've become. Leave lucky pants in Detroit on a hanger in a holiday inn that left you in tears. Gain diagnoses. Mono, the black dog, nodes on your larynx. Dengue fever, disguised as the mumps. A sty, a tumor, one zigzagged crack, sense poorly mended. Gain a few jobs, a s misgivings, a stone. Pound on the door of a neighbor who's fallen. Gain time just to lose it, a third mouth to hear. Try to make headway before the stiff headwind that hands you a punch as you rise to your feet. Try the pate, try praying. If faith in the group head is your thing, try that. Try loosening the laces, try tightening the grip. Try to let go of your quest for the perfect, good. Now, passable, worst. 
go to the basement, go get the sharp scissors, go under the knife, then again until it gets the job done, go to Tangiers, go get him an acra, go to the head of the class and then freeze. With any luck, you'll sustain this a decade. Go to the win window as the towers come down. Begin the retraining beginning with bikes. When the chop shop floods begin to bail water until 10 years in the buckets a sieve. Begin at the top where the coda both will start you to stop you in sludge. Begin the prescription infusions. Begin repairs to the woodshed that the belt will undo the first time you take you back into the dark. Begin again, begin over. To rant, to break down, to lose it, to shout. The pieces you abandon, begin to forget them. The end of the tunnel is lit. Begin to prepare. I've always loved that expression um, from, I guess it's from fundraising circles. You don't, want, you don't want to nickel and dime somebody. You want to save them up for the big chunk. Um, and I thought I would read just a few poems from Meme, um, my last collection, um, and just say a little bit about the frame for them. Um, the, it's in three different sections, and it all sort of looks at, in one way or another, how we are prepared or unprepared by our original models for connection, for love. Um, and so the first section focuses on a mother. Um, and the middle section is sort of the uh, interjected mother, the sort of really vile um, uh, voice inside. And then the third is all about breakups, um, even though a lot of the language, it sort of goes back and forth from this sort of 50s model of um, up speaking um, and a more contemporary um, and uses a lot of different forms. The first, the first two sections are fairly uniform. Um, and they intersperse the mothers, uh, which is modeled on my mother's Kansas sort of weird uh, idiom, um, with a very whiny kind of voice that comes in in the middle of each of each poem. Yeah. Yeah. When you first you introduced the first group of poems and um, talked about the vernaculars in the plural that you were, and you know I realized one of the wonderful things about and mysterious things about your uh, vernaculars or your sense of it is that you know uh, vernacular usually you know the implication is it's something that's that's distinct from some kind of standard English, meaning that it's detectable. <clears throat> that you notice when someone is speaking in vernacular. Um, <clears throat> and as I am listening to your poems and the references, that you, you know, and in speaking about the poems, as you just did as well, talking about these voices, idioms. And the, one of the things that struck me was that, and is so interesting about your handling of vernaculars, is that the vernaculars feel to me, <coughs> in listening for them, uh, muted in a way that they're almost, they feel, rather than something that's distinct and detectable, they're sort of like undetectable vernaculars. And I can't really tell when you're in or out of the vernacular. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is just about this idea of an undetectable <coughs> vernacular or the boundaries between what you're thinking of as a vernacular and right. the other kind, whatever of language is right, uh, just right. what um, yeah. you know, the, the idea. 
Because there have been moments yeah. in your in your work when you, you know, the first couple of books where you know the vernaculars you were working in were much more vivid, mm -hmm. much more easily detectable. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to me that you, you know, that you <coughs> often now work more commonly in this way with vernaculars that are hard to, to detect, at least yeah. for a white ear. Right, right. <coughs> I think. Well, I think that's. Yeah, I mean, maybe it it has to do with my growing admiration over the years for what James Tate does, which is catch that sort of, I think of it, uh, some people have talked about it as Southern, I think of it as distinctly Midwestern, kind of like, well, howdy, come on in, you know, like, want a piece of cake? Uh, where nothing is, you know, exaggerated, pronounced, usually, um, and, and yet that you, you get that in in his phrasing, in in the ways that he catches speech. Um, so maybe part of it is that, and and also a sort of growing understanding that um, yeah, it, it, linguists have to divide up English into various vernaculars in order to study them. It's like somebody with fruit flies, you know, there are certain things that it's useful to have fruit flies to work with. Um, and, and so, you know, one, you know, unless you're a bow, you can't sort of address the whole thing. Um, but in a way they're fake because it is just English. And, and so over time, I've sort of lessened that idea of there being a standard American English and then, you know, the dozens, hundreds of regional time, you know, uh, idioms. But I, I'm so fascinated by what what you can do on a page that you can't often do in real life, which is to bring a variety of voices together um, and let them clash and live there um, or harmonize and live there. Um, and, and I just, you know, the, the more figural uses of English um, are sort of, if you listen to a senator these days, it's nothing like senators, uh, which part of it we should be thankful for. But on the other hand, there was a lot of speech which has been lost. Um, so, yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so this is just a taste of the beginning. Wild goose chase. Oh dear, would you pick that up? I dropped it. Ray, don't make it too stiff. Murr's coming over to drop off the blueprints and she might like to join us. He's been a real pest all afternoon, so he's in the doghouse. Dan, you can come out, but watch your P's and Q's or stanchion where a rope marks off the object. Wallpaper striped, a slippery floor, a guard in his element, indices, and the long, slow tumble of snow. Good Lord, it's hotter than Hades in here. <laughs> Jehoshaphat. <clears throat> Good grief, you don't have the sense God gave geese. I told you this morning, I won't be your chauffeur, and take that nasty, that ratty thing off where the jays upset the feeder, under the house where Jamaica hid, hands in brook water cold. Something wasn't quite hoil about the way she got that A. No, I don't like you're just hanging out. Oh, piffle, that's not what you said last night. Not my bailiwick. It was nip and tuck until Gladys got seven in a row he was miffed, but that's how we had fun back then. Get me another ice cube while you're up. Motored here, there, to a floating bird's carcass. What bright feathers, 
What a talon or beak, said the rest. Often the sun came up on its shore side, often it shone on its nest. Well, that's what makes ball games. You say potato. Come over here in the light. There's something on your bazooms right here. Oh, it's a leaf. <clears throat> uh, this is the vile interject. Careful, she's whispering, and she's following you up the street, one hand in your shoulder bag. Careful, you vermin, you wretch, you petty cunt. Careful. She's driven you out here with her taunting, pushed you out to the extremities of town, where the dust coils in the wind and your own parched throat rasps. Go on, missy, jump but the land straight and flat and the prefab arsenal by the side of the road bears unbankable walls. Jump. Um, there's some limericks in the last part along with some longer poems. Um, so I'll just read sort of um, anachronistic limericks. Um, could have been the sea, could have been the stars. It could have been that girls, not men, were the ones from Mars. I picked up a gal in a bar. She said she'd ignore my cigar. But when I was done relieving my gun, she said I was not up to par. He stumbled outside to his car. He couldn't have gotten too far. For when I replied, your trigger's what's died, he lit his exploding cigar. Um, and then I thought I would end with sort of evergreen um, from my, uh, well, it's in assorted poems, I think. Um, and it's a response to this beautiful poem by Alvin Feynman called November Sunday Morning, which was in turn a response to Stevens's Sunday Morning. Um, and it starts with a quote from Alvin's poem, I sit and smoke and linger out desire. And it's got, um, it's called a filial republic. And out on the plaza, there were more people than had been expected. The aviators with their thick, dark muffs, the women in red clapping for Coca-Cola, the small trumpet player leaning on the fender of the car which was not his, the mechanics spreading flat the manuals for timing and for gaps, the blue majorettes, a mother who wished so hard she broke in two, those divided against the rule, Mick Jagger, the security green police, the gentle inquisitor, the woman who had not yet found the voice for tragedy, the exercise cadet with Adidas and cassettes, the deaf man elegant who bends to tie, bent to tie his shoe, the grocery clerks hanging back aloof, the girls who clutched their t-shirts from behind, the model with the cordless telephone, the guests of honor in their limousine, the New Yorker hack, the derelict smitten with their own advice, the shampooer, the plasterer, the dishwasher, the drunk, the man so sodden with sex he reeled, the crook, the benevolent sister, the priest wistfully, Alan Funt, the father crying with desire, the great conquistadors, the dreamers who looked past the crowd as it rolled in the sun, the children, exclaiming together as one hut and then another south on the horizon burst into fire. Rise up from where you are seated, smoking at a wooden desk. There has been a terrible dream in the apartment above you, and the tenant is pacing. Thank you. So 
were there any last words or thoughts? Only, yeah. Thank you. In addition to your creative work as a poet, you're also a teacher. And I'm wondering uh, if you could share with us any methods or techniques that you might use with your students for helping them find their own voices as creative artists. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I teach at this point at Princeton, it's only an undergraduate program. So, and I get a lot of students who are engineering students or um, <laughs> astrophysicists and uh, haven't really done or read much poetry before, um, which oftentimes they're, they're the, among the most interesting writers. Um, so it's, it's, but it's a different kettle of fish than teaching graduate students who have been reading and thinking about it for a long time. Um, nonetheless, everybody sort of has the same or has the same walls in their writing practice that sooner or later they reach and and in in kids' experiences of a workshop setting, um, which is oftentimes the first time they've ever shown work that they've done to somebody else um, and had them respond um, in a meaningful, not just, oh, you're great, darling, um, way. It's um, the impulse always when you sit down finally at three in the morning before your workshop the next morning um, to write your poem for the week. The impulse is always, just as it is for people who have been writing for a long time, you know, you want to write a great poem. You want to sort of write, you know, something you'll really like. Um, and that is a surefire way to um, write really wooden work. So, and particularly since a lot of these kids have been steeped in STEM courses, getting them to think associatively rather than denotatively about language. It's not like music or even paint where you can sort of distract yourself with other things and it's not necessarily denotative. I mean, we, we're, so, we're such utilitarian users of language. Um, and so a lot of what I do is just to try and trip up that way of thinking so that they will set aside not just the time it will take to write 10 okay lines, I tried, but you know, it was the night before, um, but to, to feel like they have time to play around and to just write really, really bad stuff um, and so that's, that's a lot of it at this stage um, that helps. Yeah, Brian. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna torture you a little bit longer. Um, you know, I've been writing about your poetry, or at least I wrote about your poetry back in the, I guess the 90s or early mm -hmm. zeros. And it was striking to me back in, back in the day that you're kind of an experimental poet, right? I mean, you, you seem to draw a lot. I mean, I, I probably wrote about Charles Bernstein in the context of your work and so forth. Mm -hmm. And yet you're, you know, you, you're historically, uh, you don't seem to fall into any of these, these particular categories, right? And even when I was kind of recommending your reading tonight to, to some of my students, I'm like, yeah, you know, she's kind of, she might be a little difficult or, and so forth. I mean, how do you feel about this? Is this something that you, care about, is something people bother you about, that you're not, I mean, I, I think whatever this divide is is quite stupid, but I mean, do, does anyone bother you about it? Is this something that you've thought about, I guess, is what it comes down to? Um, yeah, because when I, when I started to really um, publish or, or started to send my work out, um, that divide was really pronounced, and and to me, I, I was just sort of interested in what a whole variety of people were doing. Um, and 
And also, if you are looking at uh, writing practice as a kind of um, disruptor, um, as a way to, it's kind of in a utopian way of, of altering, altering the surface of language generally by disrupting the ways we expect to hear it. Um, that may be a similar impulse to, you know, somebody like Merrill who is writing, you know, The Changing Light at Sandover in part to just take us into a whole other experience of language. Um, and, and yet that doesn't, even though there, there may be a similar impulse there um, to disrupt things by conjuring language in a different way, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's all up for grabs. Um, there's a, a, you know, a context for, for all of this different work and a theoretical sort of background history. And, um, and so all of it just really fascinated me. Um, and I guess in terms of people's expectations for writing in a certain way, um, one of the most, I had um, a philosophy teacher in college who named Stephen Harris, who um, sort of looked like Keith Richards and smoked all through class. It was back in the day. And um, he smoked fact cigarettes. And occasionally, when somebody would ask a really stupid question, he'd just hold up his pack of cigarettes, fact. Um, but I can remember after my first summer between my freshman and or my fresh person and sophomore years going in to see him because I had been working in a local gas station. This was up in Vermont and had been working and had been reading Faulkner like all summer. And I felt this responsibility to sort of represent. Um, and so I was talking to him about it, and he said, well, you have to do what you're interested in. <laughs> and that stayed with me, um, that unless I'm doing something that is making me uncomfortable and that I'm learning from, or then why do it? Um, and people will have their own associations, and that's okay, that's part of it. I don't know. Yeah. I'm really interested in the, um, uh, the spacing in the early poems. I'm um, mm -hmm. having just finished teaching as early dying and Addie's in the spacing where the words are not. And I'm just wondering how the spacing, how you look at those spa that spacing, what it means to you, how it functions, signifies. Um, well, in, in my poems, I, I'll use spacing as a kind of punctuation, I think. Um, I have never really, I've tried, but in terms of sort of the energy field or Olson's sense of the, the page, um, uh, that's a harder fit for me. So I guess it's, it's in terms of how I hear it in my head, how I hear it when I read it. Um, Faulkner was interesting because he sort of, he just absented any diacritical marks um, in whole swaths of, of, of As I Lay Dying and, and also The Sound and the Fury. Um, yeah, so thanks. Thank you all. Um,